Buonasera a tutti, bentrovati a questo quarto appuntamento in cui parleremo dell'uso della musica in ambito neuropsichiatrico infantile e psichiatrico in, gen in generale. Era il 1943, Leo Kanner, che è un pediatra tedesco emigrato nell'America, pubblica un articolo descrivendo 11 casi di una malattia infantile sconosciuta che in pratica isola questi soggetti dal resto del mondo e li rende incapaci di avere relazioni sociali. Con questo articolo l'autismo fa la sua comparsa in campo medico, da malattia rara fino agli anni 90 è diventato oggi un problema estremamente diffuso con prevalenze che arrivano in certi paesi fino al 2% dei nati. Diciamo che in Italia siamo tra l'1 e l'1,5%. Ebbene, si è scoperto quasi subito che la musica effetta, effet, eh, esercita un effetto attrattivo eh, in molti soggetti con autismo e lo stesso Kanner lo aveva notato. E con la musica è possibile stabilire un canale di comunicazione privilegiato con questi bambini. Da qui lo sviluppo di diversi studi clinici, anche rigorosi, randomizzati, multicentrici, che hanno cercato di indagare quale fosse lo spazio terapeutico della musicoterapia nell'autismo. E un percorso analogo si è verificato per la schizofrenia e per la depressione. Il problema è che la, la complessità delle patologie che, di cui stiamo parlando e anche la complessità dei possibili modi di utilizzare la musica, e ce ne parleranno poi i relatori, hanno creato un quadro a volte un po' controverso. E quindi abbiamo bisogno, per uscire da un certo tipo di ginepraio, delle interpretazioni esistenti, dell'aiuto di due, due illustri ricercatori, Christian Gold, che sarà lo speaker principale, e Anthony Rodriguez Fornell, che fungerà da testimonial. Dopo l'intermezzo musicale, curato dal conservatorio, eh, avremo come discussant il professor Andrea Raballo, professore ordinario dell'USI. Quindi adesso chiamo, chiamerei al podio eh, Christian Gold. Prego, Christian, se vuoi venire. E dico qualche parola introduttiva. Eh, Christian, Christian Gold si è, laurea, si è laureato in musicoterapia all'Università di Vienna e ha conseguito un dottorato di ricerca in musicoterapia all'Università di Arborg in Danimarca. Attualmente insegna al Norwegian Research Center di Bergen, che è un istituto di ricerca indipendente per lo sviluppo sostenibile che si occupa di salute, di clima, di energia. Uh, e, e però insegna anche alla facoltà di Humanities di, di Vienna. Si è, occupa di evidence-based medicine sia dal punto di vista metodologico che applicativo e ha organizzato eh, numerosi studi sulla promozione della salute mentale attraverso interventi musicali e psicosociali sia in campo infantile che dell'adulto, dove si è occupato soprattutto di depressione e demenza. Recentemente si è concentrato sull'utilizzo dell'imaging cerebrale per migliorare la comprensione dei meccanismi e i processi di intervento. Quindi il titolo della sua relazione è questo e quindi gli lascio la parola. Thank you very much for this introduction and uh, thank you all for coming. Welcome. Uh, um, yes, I will give some overview about the evidence to date that we have on uh, music therapy in the child neuropsychiatric setting with a special focus on autism um, and in adult psychiatry, depression and schizophrenia. Um, yeah, like, yes. So like um, uh, Enzo Grossi already has said, I am a research professor at the North Norwegian Research Center, which does a lot of different things, like also climate research and uh, technology, which gives me the 
ability to do uh, large clinical trials that you cannot do so easily at the university. But then my affiliation to the universities in Bergen and in Vienna give me the ability to connect to more basic research uh, that asks more fundamental questions about uh, uh, how are music and health and music and mental health connected and how can we understand these uh, on a more fundamental level. Um, I have done clinical trials and systematic reviews of clinical trials for 20 years and I will be focusing 80% on that. And I have recently started to look into neuroimaging, but you will hear not so much about that, more like an outlook into the future. Music for health purposes is something very old. Probably it's as old as uh, mankind. For example, we know that uh, some uh, flutes were already made from bones, at least, uh, I don't know how old this one is, I think 60,000 years old. Um, uh, and it may also be that music for health purposes is older than that because we also know that, um, we also know from research about singing birds, for example, that they communicate with their offspring and to, to communicate something and that is uh, probably related uh, to uh, social uh, things but also to health. It is also the first way how we communicate when we are born uh, is um, through musical terms. You can imagine when we hear sounds from our mother after we are born or even before we are born, um, also the auditory senses develop earlier than visual, but also the auditory signals that we perceive are of course first not the words. We don't understand the words, but we understand the sounds. Um, and then this is also our last communication. Um, there is some recent research that uh, tells us that musical memory is still preserved even in very highly advanced Alzheimer's disease and there are some very old memories in us that will not go away even when language has gone away. So music for health purposes is very old. Um, music therapy in contrast to that is a very young profession, at least if we want to define it in modern terms. The first university courses in Europe appeared in the 1950s in Austria and the UK and then in other European countries. Um, and uh, in relation to that, the definition of music therapy often is very much connected to, uh, to a professional identity. So the World Federation of Music Therapy has defined it as the professional use of music and its elements as an intervention. And it's about optimizing people's quality of life and improving their physical, social, communicative, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual health and well-being. So it could be everything as long as it is professionally used and also according to some professional standards. Another definition, um, and these uh, publications that I'm citing here are both from Cochrane reviews, uh, so where it is more about the evidence of its clinical effects, but we always have to start from a definition. Um, so here, uh, Ken Bruscher in 1998, um, he did a later version later, uh, an updated version, but I think that was not as good as the old one, so we always use this old one. He wrote a whole book about what it actually means, that it is a systematic process. How is it systematic? Uh, what does it mean that it is an intervention? What does it mean to be a therapist, to help a client, to promote health? Um, promote health is also maybe more general than just um, listing medical indications. It's more, uh, prevent includes prevention as well, for example. And then um, it defines the elements using music experiences and the relationships that develop through them. So it's music, it's relationships, and it's the connection between those. This is actually uh, quite a useful uh, definition, but it still shows the whole uh, variety of what it could be. Why music and mental health? 
um, music, music making, but also listening to music or sharing music, any kind of music activities. Music king is what some people say, um, to emphasize that it is a, something that you do. Um, has been described as a language of emotions. In contrast to words, you don't uh, communicate facts, but you uh, communicate emotions very efficiently. Um, it is a social art and it is highly rewarding. Yeah? And then uh, mental disorders like depression, autism, or schizophrenia, what uh, are they? They include emotional problems. They include uh, problems with social relationships and problems with motivation. Uh, one prominent example where we are really um, put onto this is the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. I'll just give you one example. Because negative uh, schizophrenia, negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which often uh, occur when uh, schizophrenia becomes more chronic, uh, has to do with emotional blunting, with a lack of social relationships, and with a lack of motivation. And so it seems plausible that music could address these things. One early example that I cannot show here because the video doesn't work, at least it didn't work when we tried it before, um, is uh, from a co-improvisation that one of the pioneers of music therapy in Europe, the late Tony Wigram, did. This was a boy with autism who had lots of difficulties re regulating social interaction, etc. He was referred to music therapy. The therapist accompanied and supported him and the boy matched his tempo and rhythm and started to look at the therapist. Not because the therapist trained eye contact or something like that, but because it happened naturally in the interaction. I will say now a few words about clinical evaluation. In pharmaceutical research, we speak of phase one to three trials. By analogy, we can do the same in psychosocial interventions. People speak of complex interventions that includes everything where there can be lots of different elements. It might also include surgery or psychotherapy and music therapy. We can think, um, we can think of, um, yeah, no, so it works. Um, we can think of this as a sequence. Um, so from preclinical research where we first try to understand what is it, how can it be applied, uh, what are the elements to a phase one trial where we then first try it out maybe with a small number of people. It could be without a control group, could even be um, uh, non-clinical population or maybe it is a clinical population. Then a phase two uh, exploratory trial would be a bit bigger, would include a control group would typically give us an indication that the intervention can work. And then the definitive randomized control trial is the biggest one that in pharmaceutical trials leads to, um, to um, approval of a new drug. We don't have similar procedures for psychosocial interventions or not yet, but it is hard and um, a big effort to do such trials. And these are called the pivotal trials because they should show not that the intervention can work, but that it actually does work in the way it is done. And then after that, there could be long-term implementation. We could also think about it in such a way that it is a more circular way. And I like this alternative as well, because it is an iterative view of the development and um, evaluation of trials. And for example, in autism, um, Enzo Grossi had already mentioned the early paper by Leo Kanner in 1943. Um, which I understood thanks to the translators. <laughs> um, and uh, so he had already found out that there are, that the children with autism uh, have um, really a good sense for music. And then there were some clinical pioneers in the 1970s, Nordoff and Robbins and Juliet Alvin, who described their clinical experience with those kids. And then it was not until the uh, 1990s uh, that, um, what is this? Oh that uh, some uh, first trials without a control group but showing improvement over time with some something that was changed here, less interaction that was on purpose, um, uh, could occur through music therapy. And then there was a, this is just one example of an early trial, 10 participants, music versus play, 
and looking at how much eye contact they had um, within the session. Next step was then a systematic review, actually several ones. We had the first one in 2006 and then an update in 2014. Here I think you see the second version and you see there is an emerging picture of good effects from those trials. Um, there are also some differences in those effects. So some of those lines are further away from the zero line, which means it's a bigger effect, but then other uh, of those rectangles are bigger, which means it was a bigger study. Um, and we then did the first phase uh, three kind of trial uh, based on that. And uh, that's what you see here on the right hand side. Oops, sorry. Um, and um, we see here that it is not so easy to pin down uh, those effects because here we measured ADOS social effect that is like with a diagnostic instrument, something that's hard to change, that is far away from the actual therapy itself with a different person in a different context at a different time point. And all of the groups went down, but regardless of whether it was high intensity music therapy, low intensity music therapy, or just enhanced standard care. So in summary, what we know from this is music therapy can work, but we don't know when it actually works. This trial was conducted across the world. Uh, we, I will show you some videos, one from Norway, one from Australia, one from Austria, one from Korea, and one from the US. And you can already see from those pictures that there are some differences here, right? So there is one, the therapist in Austria is sitting on the floor. The congas are also lying on the floor. Something has obviously happened there before uh, in the interaction. The child sits somehow below the drum set and is doing something and the therapist is trying to communicate with him. Um, in Australia, they also sit on the floor, but there is a third person involved that is the father of the child, and the mother also comes into the video at some later point. So this is actually done at the family's home. Um, and then uh, in Korea, it looks much more structured again in a way, maybe. So they are sitting there on uh, chairs facing each other. There are some instruments around, but here they have only this one instrument. And in the US, uh, this is an example of the so-called Nord of Robbins therapy. They have typically a very limited set of instruments, in this case, a piano and a drum set. And then they communicate in this way. And the child is always doing the drum and the therapist is always doing the piano. Um, yeah, and in Norway, they also sit, they, they sit together at the piano. Um, and yeah, you will see how they communicate about communicating through music. And they all, you will also see some other music instruments in there. So it's a great variety and that we need to understand better. Okay, here comes the first one. Let's see if this works. Then I make some meat tea. Oh, damn, the story's going to work. So this is already after some therapy sessions have happened. They are already communicating quite a lot about how they are going to play. Preparations, more preparations. The boy really wants to have it all cleaned up. You need help. <coughs> Shall we record this? Yes. How do you want to play? Fast, slow. Mm. <laughs> He basically changes the sounds that she plays. This is how it happened in this session. Okay, next.
text. I'm, I don't have time to show the whole things, but it goes on like that. Here is the one from us. Right. Now, you know what Dad said? Daddy, what do you say? He wants a turn of the guitar. Can I play the guitar? Of course. Of course. Right. What should I play? Can you, can you make up a song? Oh, can I make up a song? Sounds good. Hey, that's great. Yeah, I'm going to sing. Excellent. Oh, yes. Right. Ready. Um, oh, I'm doing the simple, uh, the salad. Okay. <laughs> right. Ready. Ready to go. Say go. Look here. Uh. Ready, say go. <laughs> So this was also a process for them to get into this kind of interaction. This is after some sessions have occurred and this was actually a, a great moment the therapist described uh, in, in this uh, session, um, how they really, so in, in Australia, the focus was very much on how they would integrate this with the family itself. Now in Austria, it looks like this. With this child, it looks like this. So she says, ah, you have discovered this. She's really following the child very much. The child sings some notes. She picks it up and beats it. And he has discovered something else, and she follows him and uses this musical theme further. No, the how did it look? Yeah, okay. Let's start over by your ear. Okay, how about that? Yeah, so they, clearly they also get into some interaction with musical elements. Yeah. So there are the simple instruments here. You also see other instruments there, like a keyboard, but here they are just using music shakers. And this is the last one from the US. If it works, ah, no. So this one doesn't work. Uh huh. Okay. So I tried once more. No. I just need to tell you what happens there. Um, but I think I've told you already. <laughs> I've told you already, the therapist is going to sing at the piano, the child is going to... Oh, now it's working. Okay. that the child is imitating. And it goes on like that. Um,
So you could say the general theme is maybe about communication, but how it is done is very different in all those examples. And the differences could be between countries, or they could be between therapists, or they could be between children. And they are like that, partly because they have to be so. So in one uh, recent research paper, it was stated that research requires standardized interventions, while music therapy likely requires interventions tailored to the individual. Um, or it could be because the therapy was defined differently, but that was not the case in this study. I should say one thing about this study. This study was done with over, over 300 children across the world. These are the five where I have received permission from the parents uh, to, and the therapists to show the videos. I, I trust that you did not record or take pictures because we don't have permission for that. Um, but we have received permission from those uh, parents to show these. And uh, for the, all the others, we have not necessarily. But what I'm showing here in this uh, second part of the slide is that the therapeutic principles were defined across all these. And for example, if I should just pick out one, um, facilitating enjoyment, I guess that was done in all of them. Um, and um, scaffolding flow of interaction musically, um, providing a secure en environment. All of these things were done in the same way. Um, and um, following the child's lead is one of those principles as well. Um, that was, I would say it was done in all these uh, examples but maybe to different degrees. And we don't know yet, do it different children need more or less of this adjustment? Or is it different therapies that have a different style? Um, in general, this whole discussion about music and health, music and science uh, is of course some kind of tension between um, an art form, which is unique every time, and science, which is about standardization. Um, but as far as we work in a health context, we also need to standardize to some extent. Yeah, how much time do I have left, actually? 20, I have 20 minutes left, OK. So I can really talk a lot about the... Um, uh, evidence, so this is my second part now, what do we know so far? What do we know so far about uh, evidence on autism? Here we have the latest update of the Cochrane Review. So after this uh, phase three trial, and there have been 16 new studies since the last update, and we have now um, a total of 26 randomized controlled trials with over a thousand participants. The studies examined short and medium term effect of music therapy um, in, uh, yeah, you see a variation also the duration of the interventions um, in the age range, uh, children mostly, but sometimes also adults. And then we saw immediately post intervention, a global improvement um, that uh, was better in music therapy than in standard care, uh, but also other outcomes uh, like uh, quality of life, for example. You see here how the number of studies has in increased over the last few years or the decades. So in the 20, 25 years ago, there was really just a very small number of studies and then it has really taken off very much during the last few years. Also the sample size per study has increased very much, which is important for getting reliable um, data, reliable conclusions. And then we also have longer durations and longer follow-up durations, which are all important. So you can say we, have, we see an increase in the number of studies and increase in the quality of the studies. But what we also see is heterogeneity. This is one example. There are several figures like that. Um, I have already explained briefly how you need to read them. 
So on the right hand side of the, of the vertical line, you see favors music therapy. On the left hand side, you see favors control. And then you have some subgroups during intervention, immediately post intervention, one to five months post intervention, or more than six months post intervention. And we see each study in a separate line, and then each subgroup uh, summary in this kind of diamond. So what do we see? We see a clear effect during intervention, some heterogeneity, so some studies found a bigger effect than others. We see a less clear effect immediately post-intervention. There is apparently one study here that showed a very big effect, some that even showed a slightly negative effect, and many that showed a somewhat smaller but still recognizable effect, a positive one. And then you see here basically that there were very few studies. Uh, so we cannot talk much about heterogeneity there anymore. There are two studies that have looked into one to five months post-intervention, um, and you could probably see some heterogeneity here, but it's, more, it's easier when we get more studies that we really talk about uh, those differences. Right, and then for the long-term follow-up, there was really only one study that was the phase three trial that I talked about, and there the improvement in music therapy was about as much as in the standard care. There is a big discussion in autism nowadays whether we should, um, whether we should uh, focus on symptoms. So this previous one was about symptoms. The main symptom of autism is social interaction, or one of the main symptoms. Many autism advocates nowadays say we should not look at this because autism is as much a personality trait as it is a disorder. We should look at something more global and therefore we have made this new category that we have called global improvement. Um, but also there we see actually the same type of effects. Uh, immediately post intervention, two, four, six, eight, eight studies, some of them showing a very clear positive uh, outcome and others showing uh, high uncertainty with no clear outcome. I did not mention before, but these uh, horizontal lines show the statistical uncertainty or the confidence interval. So on average, we have a very clear effect. Yeah, that is good. And we, have, um, we can also say that it was a strong effect and we can say it was statistically significant, but there is still this heterogeneity between the studies that we need to understand better. I will say a little bit about depression. It's basically the same picture. Good effects, but heterogeneity. Depression, as you know, is uh, characterized by persistent low mood, diminished interest, and loss of pleasure. And um, also, and music therapy may help to modulate moods and emotions. There have been nine studies so far. They have found large effects on depressive symptoms, anxiety, and functioning. And here you see a figure with four studies. All of them showed positive effects. This is about symptoms, so the positive outcome is on the left-hand side because we want symptoms to be reduced. Um, but also here you see one study had much bigger effects than the others, and we don't exactly know why. Schizophrenia, I'm going a bit faster now because I've been told that time is more limited than we thought. Um, is a serious mental disorder and emotional and relational competencies may be a part of the focus area of music therapy. We have a total of 18 studies. Previously, there were only 10. Uh, also more than 1,000 participants, which is really a great improvement to previously. We found effects on global state, negative symptoms, which I mentioned earlier in this talk, general mental state, Function, no effect on functioning, but uh, not on general functioning, but effects on social functioning, and uh, good effects on quality of life as well. Yeah, same picture. Um, this is about uh, the likelihood of important, clinically important, so the risk of no clinically important overall improvement or the likelihood of clinically important improvement, it's a binary outcome. And um, so um, one study showed a very big effect and the other one didn't. We actually had an idea here why this might be because this year had much 
more frequent sessions and more sessions. So this is one possibility. The dose is probably important, but um, there could also be other factors involved. And then here for negative symptoms, it's the same picture. Some studies show no or little effects, whereas others show a very good effect. On average, the effect is good, but what are the differences? Where are they coming from? This was my brief outlook into other mental disorders in adult psychiatry. I'm now going back to the main field of uh, child psychiatry and autism. Um, this was from the phase three trial. One possibility of looking into clinical subgroups uh, is like this. And here you can see that low levels of functioning, nonverbal, younger children, these seem to be benefit more and that may be because music is a more fundamental communication medium than verbal language. So it's plausible. But what else? Functional connectivity could be one reason. There was a Canadian study, the Shadar et al, that we are now replicating in Austria and in Norway. And so here we see greater auditory motor and subcortical connectivity after music compa compared to after a play-based intervention that did not use music. And um, so this could uh, indicate uh, improved communication due to modified sensory motor integration. And secondly, we see reduced over-connectivity between auditory and visual cortex post-intervention in music group. And this could be related to reduced sensory over-sensitivity, which is also a problem in autism. I will not say much about this, but we are also going to, um, to examine differences in microbiome, which is also quite a hot topic in autism these days and maybe related to social behavior. And then uh, predictive processing um, is uh, another interesting field where, um, these are not my studies, by the way, this is just somebody of the same name. Um, Benjamin Gold in the US has done these studies um, and we are including something like that in our current uh, autism trial where we try to understand more the mechanisms. So briefly, we can say that music has a lot of complexity in it. It challenging, challenges us, for example, syncopations in music challenge us to make predictions and we want to make predictions about the world around us and we want to improve that. And there is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where, where the music has the, as much complexity as we can tolerate, but not too much. So most of you maybe um, like some of that music best. Most of you maybe don't like free jazz. Those who like free jazz are more likely to have had more uh, music education as well. And children like more simple songs, children's songs. And so if we understand more about that, we might be able to understand more also about music therapy. And we are therefore including this in our current trial. To summarize, music therapy can have beneficial effects and it has no or little side effects, but there is a great heterogeneity in interventions and outcomes Music therapy also includes many different types of activities, settings, and goals. And therefore, we need finer grained mechanistic research to understand what type of musicking, from listening to different kinds of active music making, conducted by whom in what setting, is most helpful for what patients and goals. And I've shown you what we know so far and also many questions of what we don't know yet. So it's what you do, it's who does it, with whom and how, and with whom among those. Further research perspectives, we need more translational research. This is my last slide. Um, we need to look into biomarkers. Uh, we need, for example, we should look into functional brain connectivity as measured by fMRI. Social motivation is one connecting theme. I believe that um, the next speaker might say some things about that. And also reward, predictive reward processing uh, as I said in the beginning, music is inherently rewarding, and as Enzo Grossi already said earlier, um, uh, it is uh, uh, yeah, it is rewarding. Um, 
if for children with autism, for example, but also in schizophrenia, we've seen that. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I look very much forward to the discussion. Bene, grazie, grazie Professor Gould, grazie Christian, bellissima relazione. Ora è, è il turno, passiamo da Vienna a Barcellona e con Anthony Rodriguez Fornell, che è un neuroscienziato cognitivo, formatosi, prego, venga, vieni pure al, al podio, formatosi all'Università di Barcellona. Ha lavorato all'Università di Magdeburgo sugli aspetti cognitivi del linguaggio e delle funzioni esecutive. Eh, ha ottenuto una cattedra di ricerca presso l'ICREA, che è l'Istituto Catalano di Ricerca e Studi Avanzati, e lì ha creato poi un, un proprio gruppo di ricerca presso un istituto di ricerca biomedica dell'ospedale di Belvitge, presso l'Università di Barcellona, e si è dedicato allo studio del processo di apprendimento e della plasticità cerebrale in pazienti sani e cerebrolesi. Autore di moltissime pubblicazioni e citatissimo, quindi ci fa molto piacere averlo con noi. Prego. Thank you. Thank you Enzo and the Ipsa Foundation and the, and the opportunity to be here to share the ideas with you. Um, I'm going to be trying to be straightforward. Um, I'm going to be presenting most my ideas about uh, some, some of the things that, that uh, Christian was com commenting. And so I'm going to be straightforward, as I said. This, this is somehow how I see uh, I've been working a lot in, in the application of music into neurological disorders, especially in a stroke or ictus. Um, and then the, the way I see is that uh, we can see music as an intervention for different type of illness from different dimensions. No? And I used to think that, uh, for example, uh, let me see if it works. Um, we, we can think about interventions which are very passive in a way that people could be listening or just playing with the games on a mobile and very active type of interventions, like when we want to train people like playing an instrument or singing. No? And each of them will be affecting different cognitive systems. For, for example, training on singing on aphasic patients will be actually training a speech motor interactions and also affecting these feedback loops between cognition, perception, and motor systems. No? And that's how we, we, we somehow conceive. No? You can actually use music and, and to a certain degree to manipulate different dimensions to see if it's more passive. And, and in, in general, music will have some benefits depending on which systems you're going to be in training and changing the plasticity. But I, the, the talk today is, is going to be on this brown element here. So these aspects here, which I think is a very important aspect, which being binds together processes related to what music is really special in creating emotions, complex emotions, peak experiences, meaningful emotional events, etc. Which is this emotion reward processing uh, mechanism, which could be we could think about that as an emotional motivational process. I think one idea is that in all these types of interventions, these processes are there. So it's something like it happens during the interaction, and as, as Christian was commenting. It's something like that, a, a, a true important element that we still don't know how it functions. No? Why, why some kids benefit more, why there is a positive emotional relationship, and especially how emotions could change synaptic plasticity, for example. No, we don't know about the power of these uh, elements still, but we know that uh, emotions and reward affect brain plasticity, and we know it can rewire certainly parts of the brain. So the idea is to understand how these, uh, these aspects work in, in, music in music in general. Right? So I'm going to be explaining ba basic fa facts or even or, no, or the things that we know from neuroscience of music from the basic aspects. You know, what, what, what we have been discovering in the re recent years on neuroscience of music and pleasure. No? So there's a famous quote, for example, from Charles Darwin already pointing to the, the strangers of music, how, how it's possible that this function has evolved in humans. And, and we know that humans really liked you know, participated in music activities, listening, whatever. We used to think that this is one of the most important activities or experiences in our life, one of the top uh, experiences. And we don't know exactly why this type of uh, function has evolved, no? Which is the, uh, the survival advantage, why it was evolving. But we know that it's really powerful in communicating emotions, in binding people through emotions, creating social bind, bind, uh, bindings, bondings, 
So it, it might have some specific advantage and still we don't know. No? I mean, the, the problem here is basically this one, how to understand how the, the music, the brain basically is decoding reward. No? So that the thing is, we have something like an acoustic organized information we call music, we don't know how it, it happens, it's created, it's an artifact, cultural artifact, affects our brain and the brain generates emotions, pleasure, very simple, sometimes it's very simple, like rough, emotions like I like it or I dislike it or it's a liking experience. The emotions could be very basic or could be very complex like, like nostalgia, uh, loneliness, whatever. It, we know really well that it affects our, um, our mood and it also creates very difficult positive uh, aesthetic emotions. I mean these are, these are all positive experiences in humans so that will create a, um, positive feedback and it will actually induce people to engage more time on that, creates curiosity and exploration and information seeking. At the end, we, we can even sometimes be like infomaniacs of music. We look for music, we look, we participate in music, whatever. No? And I want, it's also important to think that we also have the dimension of production. So we sometimes we also engage in production. So we, we're gonna be engaging in producing music by ourselves and then transforming the music we listen and also creating new experiences. No? So the, the question here is basically how how our brain is decoding that. No? So if we want, if we would be in the in the most uh, easy uh, the, the most fantastic world would be something that we know that the, the music we introduce to the to, we listen, then this has to be a particular function we don't know how that interrelates that and creates positive emotions. No? So if somebody discovers that, that could be something like the, a, a very good thing. No? So we to discover which features of music basically create the past most powerful emotions. But, but in, in a way, we, don't, we know that this doesn't exist. There is not a, sp a, sp a specific function that we can actually say, this particular chords, this particular structure, syntactic, whatever, will create positive emotions. We actually, we know that because there is a lot of heterogeneity, everybody likes different types of music. So that doesn't exist. So we need to consider what's happening inside these modulating factors. So which is your culture, which are your musical sensitivity, which are your emotions, uh, mood inductions, your personality traits, learning history, musical ability, et cetera, et cetera. So this, are the, this is a difficult, a difficult type of a study because we need to understand these functions considering all these variables. No? And at the same time, there is something special in music. It, it might not happen somehow in art, huh? but music is dynamic in time. So it will be evolving in time. So that means every time I listen something, I experience something, and the, the experiences and emotions are feedback into the system again. So now I'm, every time I, I create emotions or, or it creates curiosity or, or physiological responses, these are affecting the way I'm gonna be listening the next pieces or parts of the music. So it's very difficult because it requires to study this interactive process, for example. No? What we know from uh, early studies, and this comes mostly the next two slides from the, from the work of Robert Satori in, in, in McGill, for example, that was a pioneering work and here people were listening the, the first study using positron emission tomography um, which allowed to see the brain blood um, or the volume in different parts of the brain when people were listening music and especially when they were having a, a powerful reaction, a chills reaction, what we call a peak experience if you want. And then you see regions in the brain that, that, are, that, that are very important, for example, for reward processing, for when we experience pleasure, or when we like something extremely well. For example, this is a, the ventral striatum, which is part of the subcortical part, which is called also sometimes nucleus accumbens also some other parts like the insula and also prefrontal cortex. No? And also it's very important these parts here, which is the midbrain, where uh, these are the, the origin of the neurons that we wanna be talking a lot, which are the dopaminergic neurons, which create or innervate the nucleus accumbens and all the parts of the brain, like for example, our memory systems. No? One thing that I want to highlight here is that there is already here one thing that we, we wanna be talking about a lot, which is the, the talk between the cortical and the subcortical systems, the talk between the new evolutionary parts of the brain with all evolution, all regions of the brain that has been involved in learning and memory from ages, okay? I know that animals, of course, are represented very well. No? So I think that somehow we see here the first thing, the first evidence that our new auditory regions or, or parts of the cortical system talk with all the subcortical regions which are associated to dopamine, dopamine learning mechanisms and also the, the mechanisms that are involved in processing and experiencing reward, okay? Again, this the same region predicted the, the intensity of the chills, for example. And what I like is this study, for example, because I think that this study they published in 2014 in a science is the first one that speaks about how people are decoding information. In this study, they were 
uh, introducing people to new songs. They were like rock indie songs that nobody has listened before, and they were asking them to decide which songs they would be willing to, to buy. To, something to say, if this song is the one that you like it more, try to buy it, or they gave some coins, whatever. No? The, the takeaway take message, message here, is, or what you can see, is that the, the supertemporal gyrus, which is this region here, which is involved in processing um, music or auditory information, basically communicates with the ventral striatum, this reward center, the, the, the center which is involved in, in experiences of reward, food, taste, sex, whatever. And basically, the connectivity between those, these parts, the brain connectivity, which is basically the way that both regions interact together, or discharge together, or basically, if you want, crosstalk, predicted the way people were going to be, uh, be uh, I investing money. So if the, the, the connectivity was large, so if both regions were high cross-talking a lot, then the, you could predict which, which uh, songs going to be basically uh, betting for, or they were going to be investing. No? So again, this is the, a very interesting study which says that, in a way that the brain is able to, to decide which regions, or, or decode something between the crosstalk between the cortical and the subcortical regions, the old system versus the, and the new ones, and basically produces some signals, which are something that we call the reward signals, which are probably related to the dopaminergic signals. No? And I think this is a very beautiful study saying that we're going to be motivated to in function, d d related to how the, our, our brain basically decodes this reward. Okay? And I don't want to forget that these are the same reason somehow that has been highlighted. These are intracortical recordings in morning in monkeys, for example, which are showing the activity of dopamine, which is the neurons that innervate the, this, uh, this ventral accumbens here uh, in the midbrain. And basically, these are kind of predictive signals. So that's what Christian was saying, that whenever they are activated, they are predicting something positive. And when something is not happening because it's, it was predicted but it's not happening, they basically drop in a way. So there are signals that are prepared in the brain for prediction. And, I, and that's very important because to a certain extent, we want certain predictions. That's what was Christian saying. We want optimal sweetest box of predictions that we know something about something and we like to experience a certain amount of, of violations from the predictions. Okay. Okay, this was the first study. So I, I want to go back to the idea of individual differences because that was of the important things we, ha we need to bear in mind when we talk about the music, uh, music brain decoding of pleasure. And these are two examples, for example, of uh, stroke patients that, depending on the lesions, they might actually develop a, a musia, so the incapacity to process music after the lesion. And this is a region, especially in the right hemisphere, associated to temporal and parietal and frontal regions. But at the same time, there are other patients that develop music anhedonia, which is a strange condition. And these patients are not impaired in processing music. So they are, after the lesion, after the stroke, they don't have problems with pitch or rhythm processing, but they lose the, the capacity to experience pleasure from music. That's a strange thing, because suddenly a, 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 a patient, it could be a music, suddenly lost the capacity to appreciate music. Okay? So this, this really actually speaks about this idea that there are different pathways in the brain related to processing music and, uh, and the way that we decode emotions. No? One of the, the first studies we did, actually, in collaboration also with Robert, he was in, in Barcelona for a sabbatical, he was trying to think, OK, everybody likes music, but is it, is it true that basically um, everybody really likes that? So we wanted to uh, try to characterize the individual differences in reward sensitivity to music. So we developed something like a, a questionnaire, and we end, end up finding that the people are characterized by different factors. No? For example, for some, the factors that decide which is the, the amount of reward that you experience from music are what we call emotional evocation. So for example, I like to music a lot. Sensory motor factor is something related to how much do you enjoy entrainment at the motor level, dancing, singing, whatever. Uh, mood regulation is a factor that is very important. We've seen that at COVID, for example. During COVID, many people were basically using music for mood regulation because it's really important. No? Then there is an information seeking, uh, information sen sensation factor, like people that like a lot to, l to look for information about music, uh, invest time on music, concerts, information about authors, etc. And then the social reward, which is a, a component that is very important and has been highlighted a lot in, in the talk of Christian, <coughs> because it basically shows that people really like to share music and enjoy sharing music with other people. And you know there is a lot of reward um, that is produced in these interactions. Okay? 
And then you can actually see the distribution of people of, on this questionnaire. And everybody's more or less at the top levels. There are super hedonics, people that are going to be investing a lot on you know, in this type of activities to experience rewards, middle hedonics. And then we realized that there were some people that really didn't like music at all. So they were saying, OK, we don't like music. That's it, point, period. And then we, we, tr we, we, we tried to, to bring these people to the lab to see if they were basically a music. Maybe these people didn't like music because they cannot process music. So, And then we, we tried to, to make some new tasks with them. And what you see, for example, here is that a group of anhedonics, these people of here, a group of middle hedonics and hyperhedonics. And what you see is in other type of rewards or secondary reinforcements like food, money, sex, exercise, drugs, they actually like it more or less the same. But, but they are very unsensitive to music. They don't really like music. And that's something that we corroborated later. For example, we use it autonomic nervous measures, which is basically the, the sweating of your hands, which it reflects the emotional activation. And these are, when they were, they were listening music, the hyperhedonics reacts a lot as, as the middle hedonics, but the anhedonics, they don't react to music. But when they are winning money in another task, they basically react the same. So it's not something that these people are not really anhedonics. So it's not really that they are people that they really, they are more, you know, that basically they don't experience the world. They simply don't like music for some reasons that, uh, that we don't know. We did some MRI analysis and we also find again that this cross talk between the auditory cortex and the, and the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens, the reward center is somehow affected in this, in this um, anhedonics for, for music, but not for monetary rewards, for example. And one question that many people were asking is that if this is affecting other types of abstract rewards, like art or visual art on this uh, particular sub people uh, population, but it, and we, we tested them trying to see if they were sensitive to visual arts, for example. You, uh, this, uh, so we, we were exposed them to different type of pictures, whatever, no? And we saw that they are perfect at that level. So it's something that very sensitive only to the music aspects. And probably is the, that they are having a problem on the decoding side of this auditory and central reward information for, for musicians. So this is about the individual differences. And then we did also a study to try to prove, because that was still under, so we, we thought that the dopamine is very important because it's the, the, the neurotransmitter that is mostly involved in reward processing, but there was not a clear evidence on that. So we did a pharmacological study with, uh, that was conducted by Laura Ferreri, which she was a postdoc in Barcelona at the time, but now she's back into University of Pavia. She's a full professor, I think. And, and we did a psychopharmacological uh, study uh, and we administrated a level of, level of uh, dopamine agonist, so we potentiated dopamine at the synaptic level in certain parts of the brain, especially in the, in the, sub, uh, sub, in the ventral striatum, for example, compared to placebo and also to an uh, antagonist. We gave risperidone, which basically diminishes the amount of synaptic dopamine in the synaptic space. And then the idea was, or the hypothesis was, is if, if that's the case, that dopamine is regulating the sub subjective experience of pleasure, then we should see that people, especially when they are listening their favorite songs that they were coming into the lab with, the, we always ask them for favorite songs because that's the way you can actually see the, the amount of reward they experience. And also they had a um, monetary task. They, they were listening new songs and they also had to, to see if they wanted to spend money on that. No? So what we saw is in, in, indeed an evidence, that the first evidence that we saw is that, uh, that the, in, the, when there is levodopa, which is the agonist of dopamine, when they have more dopamine, actually the subjective experience of pleasure increases compared to when they, they have a reduced amount because they were using an antagonist. And the same time for the skin conductance level, so the amount of autonomic nervous system emotions, for example. And they also wanted to invest more in, in money, in, in particular some. So they wanted to spend more money under dopamine than under, and, and the reduced dopamine in that case. No? That was also happening in, 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 the, in the case of monetary rewards. So that's more or less the, 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 the first type of data I wanted to show you. But I want to show you also something about the memory also and the reward centers. Because memory and Alzheimer has been a, a very huge um, line of research. It's still a very huge in this, uh, line of research. We know that music therapy is very important in, in dementia because the strong 
um, capacity of musical memories to be binded in, in, the, in the brain. No? <clears throat> One thing we wanted to test, if that capacity indeed is related to the amount of pleasure that people are experiencing when they are uh, listening to music, in a way. No? So if we think about these reward centers, one prediction would be that people that are really sensitive to music and people that are experiencing a lot of reward and when they're listening to music, they might be actually um, uh, storing the, the, the new memories in a, you know, in a much richer or you know, uh, deeper way because you know, they are gonna be promoting this reward production. No? So here we, we, the theory we are using behind is a particular model, which is a model from, from reward motivated learning model from Nisman and Neuron which in basically says that if there is increase of dopamine, actually there is increase of um, long-term potentiation in the hippocampal system. So basically, just not to be too technical, the idea is that if you increase dopamine, for example, because the neurons are you know, act overactivated because something is very important for you, very relevant, very new, for example, there is increase of dopamine into the hippocampal system. And we know that the hippocampal system basically is the one that is gonna be storing new information. So the idea is that if you are able to encode information in an emotional way, increasing your amount of reward you're experiencing, basically it's like you are opening the, the gate of entering new information in the brain. You know, something like, okay, the, this thing I'm listening is really affecting me, so this is basically automatically engaging you into having the opportunity to increase the amount of information you're gonna be storing in the brain. So that could be a mechanism that we use a lot, and that could be also a reason why the memories associated to music are stored in a, in a privileged way, in a way. So that, that's the, the idea, no? <coughs> so that indeed is the case in, for, uh, this, is a, this is a very technical, uh, two studies which are very interesting, but I'm not gonna be explaining them. But it has been proved, for example, that when we encode new images, for example, and the new images are associated to large amount of money, basically these systems are uh, very highly activated and the systems are activated as soon as you present money. So it's something like when you need to encode information which is very relevant, the systems are engaged f very fast, the ventral striatum and the dopamine centers, and actually predict that you're gonna be uh, storing correctly this information. But the same, this is for external um, incentives like money, but it can also happen for in internal incentives, like something that you are really feeling curious, for example, when you're feeling curious about a particular piece of information, again, these systems are, you know, again, hijacked, so they, they, they're gonna be activated, and they actually this predict the, that basically you're gonna be storing information better. No? So that's why when we are really curious about something, probably we're gonna be learning that better, because we are pushing these systems and we're opening these gates to get, to get, to be able to store more information in the brain. So we did an experiment exposing people um, to, exposing people to <coughs> new songs, to new pieces of songs. And then what we saw is that when people are rating these songs as more rewarding, for example, they're gonna be remembered better the next day. So this is, a, for example, the songs that are remembered are the ones that were producing much pleasure in the, in the, in the people when they were listening to the song. And again, the, the individual difference is the amount of reward sensitivity. So if the people are really sensitive to reward in music, they engage in activities that really like them or music, whatever, it actually predicted better, re, re, better recall in general, so better remembering. So again, we show it that this is happening so that to a certain extent, this dopamine actually is affecting the way you store new information in the brain and probably affecting your brain plasticity in a way. No? Sometimes we, we call these systems, these dopamine networks, like a teaching signals in the brain because basically they, uh, they interact with different parts of the brain, sending information about what is relevant in the brain to be encoded. No? Again, we did a pharma pharmacological study and we again saw that people which are hedonic favorite more about this dopamine uh, increase, for example, using levodopa or an antagonist risperidone. Okay. So as I enter in conclusions, I'm gonna be willing to say that individual differences in music sensitivity quite matter a lot. And that could be something that we need to, to take in account when we, uh, well, if you want to optimize music interventions, because sometimes we, we, we don't really take in account that, so and we expose people to music, but sometimes for certain amount of people, music might not be so rewarding, okay? And then we know also that dopamine would be very important in, mu in modulating music reward, subjective experience of, 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 of pleasure <coughs> and hedonics. And again, it will be affecting a lot of learning and memory and motivation. And that's something we need to take in account when, when trying to understand 
what's happening in, 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 a, in a music intervention and how it might help us to, to provide new insights, okay? Just as of note, we also be, we've been trying recently also with another type of neurotransmitter, the opioid neurotransmitter system, because in animal research and reward, that's, it's supposed to be the one that really modulates pleasure. So we wanted to try to study if music is also related to the opioid systems and the receptors of opioids we have in the brain. So we did again another pharmacological study using in this case oxycodone, so uh, uh, opioid agonist, a placebo and antagonist. But the important thing here is that we never saw difference related to the opioid uh, neurotransmitter. This is very different from other type of uh, rewards like taste or food or, or I don't know, look into beautiful images, whatever, which are actually potentiated by opioid, uh, opioid uh, agonists. But for some reasons, and it has been already two, two new papers, uh, like Lang and a group from Vienna, Corp, et cetera, showing again that the opioid neurotransmitter doesn't work for abstract type of rewards, like th that could be, for example, music pleasure or art or other types. And we, so this is a bit uncertain. We don't know exactly why, but I wanted also to show you doing that. Recently also, I think we, we, were, we were very interested in trying to see this, you know, music is something like really intrinsically motivated. So we do that and there is no specific reward, external reward, and we invest a lot of time on that. No? So the idea is why music creates this curiosity in, in people. No? We know that curiosity is really the need to know, but the need to know in, cer in circumstances where you, you don't expect nothing, you don't expect anything. Basically, you lose a lot of time, you invest a lot of money in particular interest, but they won't be basically uh, something that you can say okay, it's going to be externally rewarding. No? But this is something very important because it's our internal motivation. So we, we experience that as something very important. No? So if you think about curiosity, many musicians say, for example, that everybody likes music, but not, so very, not everybody is very curious in music. So even some musicians say or complain that people don't listen to much music. And nowadays, it has been changing a lot. I mean, many of you, for example, re might remember going to a store and you're a second-hand store 30 years ago, choosing different long plays. Sometimes you had certain, certain pity discoveries, whatever. Nowadays, we, we, the algorithms of Spotify basically inform us which music we need to listen. So it has been changed a lot the way we explore the environment and the way we discover new, new information. So I think that trying to understand how music, uh, how curiosity is created might have a very important educational component, and it really might help uh, nowadays to, to, to navigate in this complex environment where exploration is not so difficult. I cannot go anymore to a shop, uh, long, long, you know, long play is short because it doesn't exist, so I need to navigate in a really complex one. So we wanted to, we had the opportunity to do an experiment in a, in a real concert that was an electronic festival of music in Barcelona, which is very famous, which is the Sonar Festival. Maybe some of you know that. And, and with, a with, a, we, with a DJ, we created a concert and we chose um, 20 unpublished electronic music pieces and we tested a huge group of people in the concert and we asked them to, to rate the music on how curious were about that, how pleasure they was excited, uh, producing on them and the amount of absorption. And then also later they had to, to, to say which music they wanted to buy and they entered into a lottery uh, uh, um, example. No? What it was interesting here, because that's a very complex experiment, is that we were able to predict using these signals, the curiosity, the pleasure, and the reward, a classifier actually is able to predict what people are gonna be investing on. So we can predict to which extent they will like music and how much they will be investing money on that. And again, those songs that were encoded with better curiosity were better remembered the next day during the concert. So this is the first evidence in an ecological environment where you can see actually how to create curiosity in, in people. No? And I want to highlight that there's going to be a new experiment we are participating here in, in Milano with the Philharmonic of Milan in 14th of January. And it's going to be about, again, about curiosity, but on time. So we're going to be doing a larger experiment now, now probably with 1,000 people. And maybe some of you might, might like to participate in this uh, new experiment in Milan. So again, what, what that, all of the things I'm going to be saying, what, are they useful or not for music intervention? That's the, the last part I'm going to be trying to finish. When we think about the translational power of music, it's, so we know that there's a, it's very interdisciplinary. There are people from different fields, music ther therapy, neuroscience, motor control, et cetera. And, w and for example, we've been working a lot in the developing, for example, um, therapy or a new proposal on music support therapy of motor stroke. We're trying to, to work on the idea that, that and train, training people with motor domains using musical instruments actually can change 
the interaction between the auditory systems and the, and the motor regions. And indeed, that's what the, the case. For example, after a stroke, people actually tend to improve on, on, on motor improvements, and that's normal in all the studies. But we also see a lot of advantages at the mood level. For example, they, they are better engaged, they have better quality of life later, et cetera. And this is the first study where we show it, for example, that the music sensitivity of, to reward of the patients actually predicted the amount of recovery. So in a way, the patients that are, were more engaged or like it more music experience better recovery in this particular case. So that's one of the applications we see here for that. No? We created a new type of um, trial we are nowadays working, which we call enrich-based supported memory trial. And nowadays, we're trying to, to work on a much more enriched environment. We, we work with much more instruments. We also work with uh, small groups, social interaction groups, and we have also certain goals. And we try to promote, basically, autonomy and regulation and self-motivation and trying to see what the participants are trying to do. OK, a um, couple of slides more. The way I, I see the, this, this type of, for example, the enriched music training environment we, we're trying to create is at the motor domain is very simple. So the idea is that we do repeat a lot of training just to improve the motor um, uh, in defect of the patient. But at the same time, you, you work with all of these reward intrinsic motivation systems. And in a way, also you try to promote self-monitoring and feedback in a way that you are trying to create like an experience where the, the patient, for example, is have more agency and creates autonomy. And at the end, this might be actually promoting increase in quality of life and emotions and the, and well-being in the patients. OK, I go back to the, f the first slide, for example, saying that this is the, the, the part I wanted to talk, how all these reward motivational processes are very important in the way we're going to be designing this, these approaches, how music could be basically used in different type of, of approaches. And the last slide is somehow dedicated to Jaume Plenza. He's a very, very one of the best sculptures we have in Barcelona. And he uses to, to build this, this uh, maybe you've seen some of these statues, people with a skin, base, which are basic notes or words. And he used it to say, if we have something different from animals, it's our capacity to talk and, and communicate. I love music, and for me, words are like music. The instrument is our body, and we are permanently pl playing this music, which is our conversation. The capacity to spread words in a space fills everything with energy. And yeah, thank you a lot for the, for the, for the attention. I'm looking forward to the, to the questions. Bene, molte, molte grazie professor Fornell per questa bellissima relazione, molto ricca di spunti. Siamo un leggero ritardo, adesso abbiamo l'intermezzo musicale e quindi chiamo Letizia Caspani a darci proprio un piccolo flash su quello che andranno a, a produrre. Buonasera, eh, Nonoa è un brano scritto dalla compositrice finlandese Kaya Sarajao. Il titolo di questo brano si rifà alla serie di xilografie e all'omonimo testo di Paul Gauguin, realizzati a seguito del suo primo viaggio tahitiano. Questo testo non è un diario di viaggio, ma la descrizione delle emozioni provate dall'artista durante il suo soggiorno tropicale. Le parti recitate presenti nella composizione sono state estrapolate dal libro di Gauguin e sono state mantenute nella lingua originale, ovvero in francese. No Noa, in lingua maori, significa profumo ed è questo che la compositrice ha ricreato in questo brano. È una composizione dai ricchi colori, dai forti contrasti e piena di suggestioni. No Noa è in grado di ricreare a livello sonoro quello che i quadri di Gauguin del periodo tahitiano generano a livello visivo. L'elettronica di questo brano è totalmente in live e comprende riverberi, filtri, rumori e suoni preregistrati. I file registrati sono dei controtemi rispetto alla parte flautistica, composti in modo quasi contrappuntistico e realizzati da un flautista e da una voce maschile. Questo è stato pensato dalla compositrice per generare un forte contrasto con la voce femminile di Camilla Utenga, flautista alla quale è stato dedicato il brano. Anche nei rumori utilizzati si nota l'ampia ricerca timbrica svolta dalla Sarayao, 
poiché si integrano totalmente con i multifonici eseguiti dal flautista, andando a riempire e a completare gli armonici e quindi a creare un suono dal timbro pieno e compatto. Questo tipo di elettronica implica una grande collaborazione tra i due musicisti coinvolti. Buon ascolto.
Non so cosa sia successo nel nostro cervello, però qualcosa sicuramente è successo. <ride> Molto interessante sarebbe saperlo. Chiamo adesso i due speaker qui al, ba al, al banco, al bancone, <ride> per la discussione. Prego, eh, Cristian e Antonio. Okay. 
E nel frattempo chiedo al professor Andrea Ravallo di aggiungerci come discussant. È appena arrivato all'USI dal primo di novembre eh, come ordinario di psichiatria. Bene, le facciamo tanti auguri e complimenti. Grazie. Ha un curriculum veramente molto bello, è stato come dottorato, ha conseguito a Copenaghen, è stato nominato responsabile della formazione accademica presso l'organizzazione socio-psichiatrica cantonale e anche professore ordinario presso la facoltà di scienze biomediche. È autore di molte pubblicazioni su riviste internazionali ad alto impact factor che hanno avuto molte citazioni ed è esponente di punta della European Psychiatric Association per la messa a punto di linee guida diagnostiche, in particolare sulla schizofrenia. Bene, gli lascio la parola per vedere che, che tipo di curiosità gli hanno gen generato queste due relazioni. Beh, grazie Enzo, anche per l'introduzione oltre che per l'invito. In realtà sono più suggestioni insomma, che non curiosità, nel senso che abbiamo cominciato l'incontro con una data che era il 1943, quando Leo Kanner pubblica questo articolo che è fondativo per uh, la nozione insomma, della sindrome di autismo. Un'altra data importante forse è quella del uh, 1961, quando Jankelevich pubblica La musica e l'ineffabile. Oggi abbiamo avuto un esempio di come questo ineffabile continua a inseguirci, a perseguitarci, a stimolarci, perché le due verticali tematiche, insomma, quella di Christian e quella di Anthony, hanno cercato di dimostrare come la musicoterapia, sia dal punto di vista metaanalitico che dal punto di vista di una decomposizione neuroscientifica, eh, può essere analizzata. Rimane chiaramente una componente di ineffabile, nel senso che vediamo che nelle metaanalisi c'è eterogeneità e vediamo che nella parte di decomposizione neuroscientifica Uh, ci sono molti elementi diciamo così, di lettura psicologica o motivazionale o di sottosistemi eh, forse manca ancora tutto quel dominio di atmosfera insomma, di intersoggettività che è chiaramente una componente fondamentale dell'ascolto musicale, dell'incontro musicale e verosimilmente anche di un setting musicoterapico e questo ce l'ha dimostrato in maniera anche piuttosto plastica quella parte della presentazione di Christian uh, che ha fatto vedere i video allora era chiarissimo nei video che c'era un'atmosfera di interazione o di attunement, questo è il termine che è stato utilizzato, quindi di sintonia, eh, intercorporea, interaffettiva, che va al di là di molti costrutti che noi utilizziamo per psicologizzare la musicoterapia, per cui è indubbio che c'è una motivazione, però è indubbio che c'è anche una componente preverbale, prelinguistica molto potente eh, che fa parte di quel tipo di setting e che è difficile... Eh, analizzare neuroscientificamente se non si vanno a esplorare anche delle componenti che sono intersoggettive che sono fondamentali di qualsiasi intervento terapeutico pare riabilitativo e, e questo penso che sia un po' una sfida insomma perché è quella parte di ineffabile di atmosferico che ancora è difficile scomporre al netto del fatto che le evidenze presentate da Christian e da Anthony sono evidenze importanti per per segnalare come non è semplicemente insomma, un aspetto di atmosfere, ma che c'è un effetto terapeutico, un effetto intersoggettivo visibile a un livello che eh, tocca anche insomma, patologie mentali pronunciate, insomma, come sono l'autismo, la depressione, la schizofrenia, questo è stato un esempio importante insomma, da cogliere. Ecco. Però quello che rimane diciamo così, eh, ancora intangibile e indefinibile è un po' anche la suggestione che abbiamo avuto prima con, con uh, il pezzo che ci ha proposto il, il conservatore della Svizzera italiana, cioè questo, questo profumo, il profumo è altrettanto ineffabile e forse sinestetico di quanto non sia la musica. Il potere della musica, o quantomeno qualcosa che noi viviamo in prima persona, in maniera incarnata, corporea, e il corpo, avete notato, è una parola chiave sia della prima relazione che della seconda, è esattamente il fatto che non... Uh, Insomma, la musica è sinestesia per cui trasforma in qualche maniera la prossimità alla distanza in una struttura temporale trasforma il tempo nello spazio trasforma lo spazio in uno spazio semantico affettivo interpersonale e al tempo stesso in un mondo di rievocazione di proiezione nel futuro e tutto questo ecco perché è un elemento se volete anche proto mentale che indubbiamente ha un effetto poderoso o mh, comunque cospicuo e quantificabile anche in campo terapeutico come lo ha 
eh, in termini di immersione esperienziale quando ognuno di noi ascolta una composizione, la crea, la immagina o, o diciamo così, combina immagini e rievocazioni mentre ascolta un brano musicale. Quindi vi ringrazio, non so Enzo se vuoi aprire la parte di domande del pubblico. Ma se hai tu domande in particolare, prego. Se... Sì, io non vorrei diciamo così ingessare eccessivamente l'atmosfera, però sicuramente due spunti importanti sono a due, due domande puntuali, sì. Quindi a, altrettanto brevi. Sì. Eh, a Christian chiedo se ha qualche suggerimento per addentrarsi in questa lettura meccanicistica degli effetti terapeutici in campo insomma di, di schizofrenia, depressione, di autismo e ad Anthony chiedo se è possibile diciamo così in questa decomposizione neuroscientifica molto sottile, molto interdisciplinare che lui ha proposto pensare a uno sfondamento un po' più su aspetti diciamo così intercorporei quindi di sintonia tra Uh, diciamo così il, il terapeuta e il fruitore il terapeuta e il paziente Christian ok uh, use of this, this mic so you ask the question that, to which I do not know the answer <laughs> I have worked for 20-30 years on it and I don't know the answer yet I will not come up with the answer this evening because um, I don't know. But you have certainly mentioned some um, important aspects. You mentioned intersubjectivity, you mentioned attunement. So uh, they really point us to what is the challenge of trying to go from the more pre-structured stimuli that Anthony has been working on and many others in the neuroscience and music field uh, to this more interactive, much more flexible and less structured way of working. What we are doing at the moment is we are trying to go one step towards that more structured type of therapy, but I would like to go more steps in this direction. So the, uh, the international, the multinational study that I showed really left open a lot about the equipments. It did have a manual, but the manual talked about principles, not about activities. We are now doing this binational study, replicating and extending the Canadian study. Here we have standardized the instruments, we have standardized the activities, but we are still allowing some leeway in how the activities are done and uh, how in what order they are done. So there is still this dialogical element between the child and the therapist, which we and also the therapists, not least, believe is very important to keep. Um, One challenge that we have not solved yet, we have we discussed it when Anthony was in Vienna some months ago, um, is uh, we need something that we can measure immediately because at the moment we are still measuring longer term outcomes. So we have three months of therapy and then we measure changes in the brain. We cannot do an fMRI every uh, week or so. Or <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not uh, possible or maybe it is, but. It, definitely not within or right after this specific activity. So I would like to go more steps in this direction to understand more this transition from a specific activity to a specific short term or me immediate change in brain and behavior to this longer term change that we want to achieve clinically. Okay. Bene, sentiamo Anthony. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention also something about the what you were commenting on the intersubjectivity level. I mean, I, I think what you said is very important because I see that neuroscience has been walking a walk, which is very reductionist in a way because mostly the things I've been showing you for reward the music is so, so basically something like I like or dislike the music or how much do I like it or I don't like it. So this is like the the first step in, in order to define something like a, a science of a neuroscience of music or something and and it's missing all the huge land, emotional and rich landscape of emotion that uh, the music is creating, no? I mean, we have big experiences. Uh, music has been used in transcendent states, in absorption states. So it's really much more powerful than what basically says this music, I like it or I, I dislike it. So the problem is how to arrive to, uh, to study this, um, this uh, subjective component, no? I mean, the, there's probably more and more to do on the qualitative type of research. How do you combine 
and neuroscience and you know and trying to investigate more on this ki kind of complex emotions and and I think also about the meaningfulness of music you know that it provides something which is very meaningful for humans and this is not represented in this neuroscience you know picture it's basically is a mechanistic me very mechanistic picture about you know how the centers of the brain are communicated to all structures how do we decode that but it's really difficult to understand I think that one <coughs> we've been commenting a lot with Christian about the, you know how to evaluate the components that are in the videos for example that you were showing is so variable that it's very difficult to to think about that yeah how can I can I know which other comp I mean the, the important thing of a, of a therapy in music for example it could be like to decompose the different dimensions of a therapy you know like the social component the interactive component the number of instruments is played whatever no and this is difficult no? because uh, you know you need to provide a structure to something that is on a structure. So <laughs> I don't know how it could could be done, but I think <coughs> I think one one th one I, th I think many people in the field a bit, we are a bit tired of the huge randomized control trials because it doesn't seem to be we we invest so much years in that and maybe sometimes with a single case study it, you you get much more information. So I don't know if you think about that. In the same, I mean, sometimes we do single case studies and they are very well controlled with different baselines, different types of um, designs, and then you actually you can control better the intervention components sometimes. I don't know if we need to move more into a, I don't know, more pragmatic, I don't know, single case or something that it could be more rich in the way we can talk about the components of the therapy. No? Do you want me to respond something to this? Or do you know? No. I know. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, we need all of these. I, you know, you remember I showed this circle, this iterative view. So from the large, simple trial that was important for understanding what we don't know, we then need to go a step back to a smaller trials. Bene, adesso vorrei che lasciare uno spazio per le domande dal pubblico. Scusatemi, ma siamo un pochino in ritardo. E poi prima, prima che mi dimentichi, dato che i tre speaker parlano velocissimi, io dare, farei un applauso alle nostre due traduttrici. Ci sono domande dal pubblico? Bene. Bene. Un buon segno a volte. <ride> Allora possiamo magari proseguire se Andrea avesse ancora una, una osservazione, altrimenti credo che ci sia ancora molta strada da fare, non so se l'avete capito, eh, qui le cose sono difficili, eh, gli studi clinici hanno delle, delle aree di, di debolezza intrinseca, problemi metodologici che cerchiamo di applicare alla musica come se fosse un farmaco, in realtà non è un farmaco, per cui noi stiamo usando una metodologia nata per studiare i farmaci per misurare altri tipi di attività eh, terapeutiche, quindi questo è un primo problema. E poi la complessità della parte neurofisiologica, e delle scienze cognitive, è tutto molto intrecciato e c'è bisogno di una grande collaborazione tra clinici da una parte e, e neuroscienziati dall'altra. Credo che siamo sulla strada giusta, ma non so se voi avete qualche, qualche idea su come poter migliorare questa situazione, ditecela per favore. Vabbè Enzo, c'è un lavoro concettuale da fare chiaramente, perché in qualche maniera diretta, indiretta, più o meno esplicita, emerge una certa insofferenza sul fatto che noi stiamo e spiantando metodologie pensate per trial farmacologici a qualcosa che non ha una qualità farmacologica dal punto di vista insomma, né della somministrazione né della produzione né plausibilmente del tipo di effetto diretto in più c'è il fatto che nei trial farmacologici noi ragioniamo per gruppi per esempio ragioniamo in termini o di individuo e mentre qui abbiamo a che fare quantomeno con delle diadi che è un altro aspetto diciamo così di cautela metodologica per mitigare il riduzionismo che è necessario per poter, diciamo così, quantificare, scientificizzare un tipo di esperienza come questa, insomma. E poi c'è un aspetto che è una suggestione, che non, non ricordo se è di Christian o di, o di Anthony, 
eh, in realtà di entrambi perché eh, Christian diceva ok, l'esperienza musicale forse la musicoterapia è antica quanto l'uomo perché è una forma di aggregazione è fortemente sociale ma non sociale in senso top down è sociale in, anche in maniera quasi spontanea e credo Anton insomma, ha accennato all'apporto all madre-bambino che si svolge nella fase prelinguistica preverbale essenzialmente su una base ritmica interaffettiva, intercorporea che ha anche una componente di modulazione sonora che di fatto è una protomusicalità questo è un altro aspetto che potrebbe essere molto suggestivo eh, quantomeno per legare i due campi ecco, in chiave neuroscientifica e di psicologia dello sviluppo per poi passare a un modello patogenetico perché è difficile derivare le patogenetiche quando c'è eh, diciamo così ci sono delle sfere epistemologiche a volte così distali eh, come quelle delle neuroscienze e quelle di un'esperienza eh, interpersonale quale quella musicale per esempio quindi questo gap che poi insomma è anche il gap mente corpo mente coscienza non è un gap che si supera semplicemente spiantando le metodologie ma insomma sia Christian che Andrew ne sono perfettamente consapevoli ce l'hanno dimostrato nelle presentazioni il punto è che è difficile articolare, non so come dire, un, un pathway di ricerca che possa includere questi aspetti in maniera sistematica. Quindi il primo passo probabilmente è analizzare alcuni dubbi e vedere se le categorie che utilizziamo sono effettivamente qualcosa che ci apre spazi di ricerca oppure che ci occlude orizzonti di visibilità. Bene. Allora, siamo praticamente al termine della, della serata. Se nessun altro ha domande da porre, io cercherei di chiudere la sessione. E ringrazio ancora Christian Gold, Anthony Fornells e eh, Andrea Raballo.